After speaking with Richard Rosario, I'm not quite sure what to believe. I'm innocent, and I'm always be innocent no matter what the justice system does. Yes, I hear this a lot from inmates, and I often don't believe their claims. Why? But something about Rosario's story is compelling me to push forward. Maybe it's how simple it all seems. I mean, he was either in Florida when this murder was happening in New York, or he wasn't. We're on our way up to the Bronx right now, to where George Colazzo was murdered. First, I need to learn the details of the crime. I get a hold of some police reports, but there's nothing like visiting the crime scene. I like to see for myself where people were standing, what they could see, and what they could hear. And to help me make sense of it all, I knew just who to ask. You know, there's a lot of cop speak in these pages that Bobby can help decipher for me. Bobby is former NYPD homicide detective Bobby Adelorado. He was a cop for 20 years in the South Bronx, where he took down vicious gangs and locked up killers, all from the same area where this crime happened. I first met Bobby in 2002. That's him in the hat. I'm the guy to the right with the headphones around my neck. This picture was taken on the day he was promoted to detective first grade, the highest rank an NYPD detective can achieve. Back then, I was working on a documentary for Dateline, following Bobby as he fought to free two innocent men who spent 15 years in prison for a murder they did not commit. Bobby became so frustrated with the case, he resigned from the job he loved. Good luck. Do something good with your life, man. All right? I learned a lot from Bobby, and not just about police work. He's one of those honest, salt-of-the-earth guys, and he agrees to help me. I'm going to find you. Bobby hadn't heard of the case, so I sent him the police reports I collected, and after he reviewed them, we meet up in the South Bronx, in a parking lot near the corner of White Plains Road and Turnbull Avenue. I feel like a little older since the last time we did this. <laughs> How are you doing? Strangely enough, it's almost 19 years to the day of the murder. And it's even the same time of day, 1.30 in the afternoon. So explain to me what happened. How did this go down? It starts right around here. This is where the initial contact happened. Bobby explains that four people were involved with this. The victim, a 17-year-old kid named George Colazzo, and his friend Michael Sanchez, who were walking through the parking lot, and two other men walking toward them. According to the police reports, it's a bump. There's words passed. I'm so calling, I'm, I'm the victim. Out. So I'm going this way. And this is... Right. So there was a brief confrontation and some smack talk. According to the reports, it was a random encounter. The victim, George Colazzo, and his friend Michael Sanchez walked down here and make a left. The reports showed that the other two men split up. One went to a car while the shooter followed Colazzo and Sanchez down this side street. The shooter said something to George, and he turned around. Something is said, and he turns and shoots the kid point blank. He goes, what's up, man? And it's bang. Where was he shot? Shot in the face. Shot right above the lip. After the shooting, the shooter went back down the street, got into the car. The car makes a U-turn and goes southbound on White Plains Road. Cops and an ambulance arrived within minutes. George Colazzo was rushed to the hospital, where attempts to revive him failed. Police combed the area for any evidence. They didn't have much to go on. Unfortunately, 1996 was 1996, 20 years ago. Now there's cameras everywhere. You see three cameras on that building yeah. right there. So no video, but there were two eyewitnesses. The first, the man walking with the victim, his friend Michael Sanchez. The second eyewitness was Robert Davis, a porter who was sweeping just a few feet away from the shooting. So when they take Michael Sanchez and Robert Davis back to the station house, they ascertain as much information as, as they can from them. Both Sanchez and Davis described the shooter as a Hispanic man in his early 20s. At that point, you have a physical description, male Hispanic, and you have your books. Books is cop lingo for binders full of mugshots that each precinct keeps of people who have been arrested in that area. Michael Sanchez, the victim's friend, said he saw the shooter in one of those books and pointed to a picture of Richard Rosario. Sanchez picks out Rosario. That afternoon? Two hours after the, the incident. Later that evening, the porter, Robert Davis, also pointed out Rosario's picture. Two eyewitnesses, not good for Rosario. And the fact that his mugshot was in that book meant he'd been arrested before. I asked him about that. 
Why was your picture in there? For robbery. Who did you rob? I got caught with um, credit cards. It's opposed to saying you got caught by credit cards. It's more appropriate to saying you robbed somebody of their credit cards. Yeah, of course, of course. I'd already done a little homework and actually knew about Rosario's criminal past, including acts he committed as a juvenile. But I want to test him to see if he'll come clean about it. And he does. I was um, your regular run-of-the-mill hoodlum. And it's something that I regret. But it's a, it's a part of my life that I can't avoid or deny, you know? I was a kid growing up in the Bronx and um, I learned the wrong habits. But that doesn't make me a murderer. And that doesn't make it right for me to be in prison for a crime I didn't commit. Now, this is where things get tricky for me because he sounds like he's being honest. But maybe I'm being played. Admit to the robbery, deny the murder, fool the reporter. But if this was a lie, it was such a bold-faced one. He said he was in Florida at the time of the crime, literally a thousand miles away. And remember, he said that on the night he turned himself in 20 years ago, he gave detectives a list of alibi witnesses who could confirm his story. Um, their phone numbers, their addresses. How many names of witnesses did you have? 13. 13. 13 alibi witnesses? It sounds like a lot to me. But when I read the police reports, I didn't see any interviews with any alibi witnesses. I'm thinking that if Rosario gave police 13 alibi witnesses, surely a detective would have followed up. Back at the crime scene, I asked Bobby about that. But if the suspect, when you pick him up, says, I was in Florida, and, okay. here, and here's some information, right. do you look into that? I would say you should. Maybe the detectives just didn't have the time. I was, you know, it was busy back then. I hate to say this too, but it comes down to dollars and cents. You got an arrest, the case is closed. Move on. Are you kidding me? Nope. And, and it was what do you say? But I'm a, but I'm law, a detective. Law. I need to find out if this is true. I need to go to Florida. Go to the DA's office and ask me they'll pay for you. You're not yeah. kidding. I'm not kidding. We were denied to go places. You've got two eyewitnesses, detective, that say this guy did it. Yeah, but he says he has 13 alibi witnesses in Florida. So tell him to bring up his 13 alibi witnesses. It's more important to him to prove he's innocent at this point. Tell him to put it on his dime and tell him to come on up. So I decide to put a trip on our dime to find out for myself. So here we are in Florida. We just got here. That's next on Conviction.